with great pleasure. And yeah, many thanks for uh, having you, uh, having me with you today. And it's a great pleasure for me to talking to you. And uh, as mentioned by Dr. Aldajani, unfortunately, I have uh, to connect a connecting meeting uh, at, at three o'clock with um, uh, uh, which I could not postpone, but that gives us one hour, and I'm happy to getting in presentation first, but secondly also in a discussion about the topics digital humanities and, and cultural heritage, particularly it's a case of 3D modeling. Let me briefly start with an introduction who we are. So we are based in Jena, in that nice building here, uh, where also the Armina headquarter is uh, located in. Uh, as a research group, um, we are extant since 2019, having currently 27 members in our group, uh, five postdocs, five PhD students. Uh, I'm really happy about to, uh, that we have, uh, I would say, more or less the same number of disciplines in our group like members uh, and that means that we are having a very interdisciplinary view on topics of digital heritage and digital humanities but also um, using methods from humanities from computing but also from social sciences to dealing with that. Our main topic is about 3D, 4D applications, objects and images what we are doing there, happy to tell you in a minute. For our meeting today, I have brought with me to starting with some conceptual challenges of digitization and cultural heritage. In the second section, I would be happy to discussing with you or presenting to you about some, also, uh, I would say, current research and development strands. And finally, would be happy to have a joint look on some of the topics we are uh, working on in our professorship. Let's maybe start with cultural heritage. I think uh, many of you have a idea and understanding about what cultural heritage is to recapping and maybe remembering these things. So cultural heritage could have different facets, starting of course with tangible heritage, monuments for instance, but also including intangible heritage. So language, uh, customs, uh, et cetera, dance, for instance, uh, to cultural behavior, which fall under the second category. Uh, one type of heritage, which is maybe not so much known for many is this point of natural cultural heritage. So mountains or geological formations fall under this. And finally, we have digital cultural heritage and digital cultural heritage is a bit special since it means at the one hand, digitally born content, for instance, computer games, but also um, approaches, products to deal with the other types of cultural heritage with digital means. For instance, creating 3D representations of cultural heritage objects. In case of 3D modeling, we have another important distinction, and that is about uh, is a object extant or not. So, of course, we have still extant cultural heritage objects. I think you have a good idea of um, also what could fall under this. Vice versa, we have uh, no more extant cultural heritage objects, so being altered, modified, destroyed, whatever. In between, there is an, another category which is a bit special, and that means uh, only conceptualized cultural heritage. So, of course, also ideas, for instance, about planning, in our case, for architectural items, are at least envisioning a heritage object, even if that one has never been realized and made extant. That is relevant with regards to a 3D modeling process. And on a conceptualized way, we have um, two main approaches on that. One is to acquiring 3D geometries, properties, 
by digital surveying methods, for instance, photogrammetry, laser scanning, etc. And do it, do that for still extant, uh, still uh, visible, measurable, etc. Uh, cultural heritage objects. A second approach is dealing with non-tangible heritage, either no more extant or being intangible by default. And that means that we are 3D reconstructing, so mostly done via human interpretation based on sources, uh, etc., and using this for creating a 3D model. In the end, in both cases, we have a 3D model, mostly a computerized model, and that one indeed could be used for other purposes again, for instance, being visualized, being used for a chatbot, for instance, in case of a language model, etc., or being even rematerialized or materialized in terms of 3D printing, for instance. Another important distinction or definition uh, is of also about particularly the sources of a 3D modeling. And in our case, architectural history, we are dealing mostly with architectural drawings, if dealing with specific objects, architectural buildings, for instance. But if transferring it to a larger scale, urban scale, for instance, also cadastral uh, plan material. Also, historical photographs, vedutes, etc., are of high relevance specifically since they are directly providing an insight about how historical objects facet has looked like. Also material evidence, so remains or uh, also some uh, next group, uh, elevation models and street grids, the next category are of high relevance, for instance, to providing an idea about where object or a building has been located historically or what could be the maximum minimum determinations dim dimensions of this historical building and finally in some for specifically older objects in most cases only textual descriptions are available describing historical architecture historical buildings so what would that mean with regards to, I would say, conceptual challenges? We had a chance to uh, investigating that as a research network during the last six years, more or less. And uh, we are now in this phase where we transferred it into a handbook will be published within the next days. And some general, some overarching issues challenges are at the one hand about this, I would say, transformation, the model creation process. So in a simplified way for researching a historical object, specifically in that case, a no more extent historical objects, we are having different, I would say, ways of transforming in between. So there are sources which are describing this object, there are, uh, there's of course the observers, the viewer of these sources, the researcher, and again, also a specific, I would say, few set of uh, mindset to deal with these kind of sources. So you see at least three tile steps of transformation during which I would say a simplification, an alteration, maybe also highlighting of specific aspects takes place. And you know about the story where one person tells uh, about one thing and after three or four other persons, something completely different comes out. So hopefully it's not the same way here, but uh, at least there is a kind of modification. From a conceptual point, if you are bringing computers in here and we have the additional step at least for transferring something into a digital form, also in some cases by additional persons doing that. And then again, visualizing or uh, highlighting it via outcomes or outputs, et cetera, with the results that we have at least two more steps in here in which this kind of information, uh, idea about the historical original or whatever is getting transformed. 
Finally, it would mean that we are having, I would say, a, a multitude of specific challenges related to 3D models and modeling. And one is, of course, these multi-steps uh, we are having here, so, which leads to the question, how do we document and how do we make transparent at which point these kinds of modifications are taking place? A second point is related to the question of uncertainty. I think you can clearly imagine that, uh, of course, having a historical building or a historical uh, situation uh, maybe even depicted, in some cases only described by a text, are missing much information uh, in comparison to a original. So how do we deal with not having any information about the materiality? Or how do we deal if only one side of a building is depicted? What has been on the other side? Open question. So it is something where we are having this issue of certainty slash uncertainty. So that is something also on a conceptual way colliding, for instance, with, I would say, an important step. So, uh, historical studies, historical sciences made during the last half a century in order to coming to a way where it is no more the point to describing how a building, how a situation looked in a holistic, in a full way, but to working problem-oriented, constructivistic, uh, and only describing what sources are um, uh, having insight or could tell about. Now, we have a step back on that, on a conceptual way, how to deal with it. And finally, it's about some other topics, you, scholarly discourses, for instance, how to criticize and how to amend, how to adopt 3D models made by one person. So, of course, in textual production or textual uh, discourses, you know very well, you can say you are replying to something, quoting specific parts or so on. How do you do it for a 3D model? At the moment, not fully answered. Images, so how to creating imagery out of this and what kind of information does these images uh, contain and how to do it in a way to uh, clarify what is secured knowledge versus uncertain knowledge, never open issue. And finally, interdisciplinary teamwork. So in most of the processes, there are at least two, three, four domains or skills from these two, three, four domains are included. Person dealing with sources, a person doing the modeling, a person doing the visualization, etc. So it is a challenge also how to connecting and how to linking these different work processes to each other. After now having a bit an idea about the uh, conceptual challenges, let's maybe dive a bit into the technological challenges. And one important point at this moment is to making this 3D modeling process more efficient. At the moment, it's a very, I would say, handmade or very labor intense process. And there are lots of struggles to automate this. So, for instance, that one who uh, were a that of 800 plus cameras are doing a photo at the same time and therefore uh, can calculate a 3D model from these different photos more easily without a longer durée. Another approach is to not defining all objects or I would say single uh, uh, facets of an object itself, but to creating rule systems uh, to saying, for instance, that a building is having a roof on the top and at minimum four walls, etc., in order to creating this based on the rule set. Again, to enhancing the efficiency of modeling. Another set is also to involving users in this process. And that has been one important example from Germany, from the uh, uh, Neuen Museum in Berlin where there has been the rumor if a, a artistic collective uh, went into the museum room with a Kinect and scanned the bust of the historical Nofretata. In the end, it turned out as a hoax, so they didn't do it, but modeled it very accurately. 
but uh, at least there has been a large discussion about that. Is it allowed to digitize content as user and uh, who is having the rights, the legal privilege for doing this or doing this not? So in Germany has been a large, I would say, uh, discussion about these topics, while others, for instance, at the example from the British Museum, dealt with that more um, proactively. So they invited uh, persons to do the 3D scans on their own in order to enlarge their repository of digital derivates. So that's the opposite way to deal with that. Visualization. You certainly have seen uh, the Google Street View, uh, which means digitizing or photographing uh, our world in uh, at least 360 degree panoramas. What is maybe not that common is to learn about that Google Arts and Culture has also started an initiative long ago, of course, uh, for digitizing inner museums, for instance, that one in the Rieks Museum. Besides that, virtual reality, so the creation of uh, virtual worlds, completely synthetic views, uh, mostly uh, associated with these glasses, so the UR glasses. That's another story where lots of applications in museums worldwide are extant. So we had a chance to um, conducting or co-conducting a, a EU project on that with ending after, after several hundred uh, applications spotted maps there and that has definitely been far away from all which are available. What you may have seen during the last month has been the advent of this uh, Apple uh, glasses. So uh, Apple glasses are strictly seen a UR glasses, so only virtual reality, but also have opportunity to deal with augmented reality. So that means the enrichment of our real world view in the camera uh, the image in most cases by synthetic elements as here with this example from our group about the uh, Zwinger and the photo matching here. And finally, an important point is also to merging game engines and series gaming. Why bringing both parts on one slide? At the one hand, it's, uh, I would say, a large-scale tendency to use these uh, uh, virtual or, or these uh, creation kits for games, also for serious gaming, for depicting cultural heritage content, vice versa. There are several games now which are not only, I would say, uh, produced for leisure, leisure, but also including, I would say, uh, educational education modes. Uh, for instance, that one, Assassin's Creed, uh, with its discovery mode. And finally, it's about uh, spatial visualization. So these approaches I have shown so far all need a device a digital device on user side, but there are also some uh, approaches not needing any more user-based uh, devices. So for instance, one example from our group uh, dealing with holographic projections or on a much larger scale on the right side, these quarter-based point clouds, which our colleagues from uh, Ars Electronica tested in 2016. And I know that it is very much also uh, used on other places. So uh, I recently got feedback from Shanghai where 3,500 of these multi this has been used for visualizing the outlines or the outer points of a uh, specific object. Rapid manufacturing or 3D printing. Uh, of course, many are uh, Techniques, approaches are available. So for instance, this filament-based one on the left side, but also uh, some sinter based ones with this DLP, digital light processing approaches, all with the results to having a uh, basically manufactured uh, uh, object in the end. That has been addit additive uh, approaches. There are also some subtractive uh, approaches where material are, I would say, discarded at this point. So for instance, one uh, production example, uh, 
for a steamship hull uh, was with laser inner gravings, uh, where I would say a cross laser is overheating a specific part of a, a glass cube and therefore creating these micro cracks, which in the end comes out this kind of 3D structures here. User engagement. Storytelling is a big topic. So no more having 3D objects alone, but to bringing it into context. And that's one nice example from our colleague in, from Melbourne, from Australia, uh, who did his PhD uh, about using these kinds of daily life situation, simulation of the medieval and covert, and therefore bringing 3D objects also in a larger context. A similar, also large scale and uh, um, trend is to involving citizens into the production of knowledge, not only by collecting 3D models, but to contextualizing. So for instance, Wikidata and, uh, is something you certainly know about and which is also maintaining a collection of 3D models and to contextualize these models with locations, etc. And also involvement of citizens into these, I would say, documentation processes. So that's one example of our group. We did last year together with the ICOMOS, where it is a reconstruction service specifically for heritage in risk. So how to having an easy to use workflow with uh, on a, I would say, very simple smartphone for digitizing a 3D object by photographing it and uh, putting some metadata there and then having a 3D reconstruction on the other side to getting a 3D model out of that. Also, user-generated or user-collected models, that's another big issue. And for instance, Sketchweb uh, is the largest 3D uh, repository worldwide. In 2019, they had around 100,000 3D models uh, tagged with cultural heritage. So one example is that nice 3D model of the Van Gogh room here. Uh, now it's even much larger. So um, uh, just to showing you that this, uh, there are some really large repositories of 3D content are available nowadays. And finally, a never research challenge, in that case, associated to heritage data. And you certainly know about web 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 maybe, which means not only having human computer bidirectional interaction, but also having, I would say, a semantic web approach in terms of having different computers providing in that case, structured information to uh, serve a specific use case. In case of 3D models, it means that it is very much about multimodality, so combining 3D models also with textual, with image-based information. So that is one example from our group for such an environment and where it is very much about to documenting where inputs for a 3D modeling came from and what has been the source documents of that. Also to automatize this, uh, that's another big strand, big topic. So how to uh, connecting specific parts of a 3D models with underlying textual, but also image, audio, uh, and even smell information in order to getting this kind of uh, fully equipped uh, linked data approach. So you see that it's maybe a bit older uh, example here, 10 years old at this moment, but it's still an open research challenge. And we are now just finalizing a large research project to also dealing on that with uh, architectural data. And finally, you may excuse for not having translated this slide, but it's about long-term preservation. So you, in most cases, data is, 3D data is still stored into commercial uh, shareholders, commercial companies, and there is indeed no guarantee what happens if one of these shareholders 
changes its business model or decreases its services or get uh, taken over by another company or whatever. So this issue for preserving and specifically preserving on a long time these 3D objects, models, data, that is a still current, a still ongoing one. Let me now come to one example from our group. And in our group, we are dealing very much with the creation of 4D model from historical sources. Um, in that case, it's not only that we are doing it in a manual way, but it's very much for automating this process. So the challenges here are that um, the current approaches, which are well working for creating 3D models in Google Earth or NASA Worldwide, or also these uh, Apple Maps, where you have these 3D views on, his, on contemporary cities, that is well established, but these approaches are not working well for historical material. So that is one of our main research topics in the longer time. And also it's connected to specifically the time variance. So how did also these 3D models change over time, bringing this as a full dimension in the air. And for us, it's also very much to serving different scenarios with that. So the idea is how could we create this on a world scale and how to, could we use this as a um, also practical application uh, for visualizing and viewing these things on site, but also for having access to other types of information. So our main pipeline is for having, I would say, combined uh, algebraic, but also uh, machine learning uh, based approaches for doing this. So in most cases also having, I would say, uh, map data plus also historical photographs as an input, but of course also additional sources as 3D model. And in the end having different ways for using this. So I have shown two scenarios here. One is for having an idea about how a specific site, specific situation changed over time uh, in the past. But also, and that is the second example below, how this uh, could look like in the future. So for using this for transferring and enabling co-creation on uh, plant uh, architecture for uh, forecasting. One of our reference applications is this so-called 4D uh, browser. And the main scenario, so by the way, that is uh, working in the Saxon State Library. And uh, the main scenario here is to have access to additional sources on, based on a specific location, but also doing an analysis. So for instance, how a photographic behavior changed over time and uh, depicted objects, how it changed over time. Another strand is for having on-site uh, views by smartphones. And that is one application where we are, I would say, uh, working also um, on having it, I would say, a 4D view enabled in a browser on mobile phones. Works with iOS, with WebKit, uh, but also with Android, mobile, Chrome, etc. browsers. And in our case, the speciality is to do the model creation on the fly worldwide. So I tested it just last week in Korea. It works also sehr well. Uh, of course, it changed, depends a bit where, which kind and amount of uh, data and information is available, but at least uh, uh, for having access to Wikipedia articles, et cetera, that is something which is worldwide available. On that, we are also conducting other activities. So for instance, we had a citizen sign uh, contest last year with 4,500 uh, images collected uh, and uh, also enriched a bit in, uh, in Jena. And uh, therefore another strand is for instance, having educational uh, approaches on that, how to teaching people, uh, pupils school citizens for dealing with that and filling this kind of 4D applications with their own tours, sharing their experience on that, etc. 
maybe after this small look on our group, maybe uh, let's have a joint look also on what are larger developments in that field, maybe specifically in Europe. And at the moment, um, at least in, uh, in the European Union, there is, uh, I would say, very much ongoing in that field. So, for instance, uh, to build up a, a joint data space, but also starting from next year, a joint tooling space. Plus also, there is, I think, a large uh, initiative also for triggering and for supporting uh, business outreach of these things. And uh, what is maybe newly starting uh, is, of course, to have this uh, a counterpart part on research in that field. So uh, that are some mm. different strands, specifically dealing with digital methods on cultural heritage. Vice versa, there are also some uh, connecting strands dealing with uh, artificial intelligence most uh, mostly, and using cultural heritage as one field of application, for instance, for uh, energy conservation, etc. In our case, it's uh, one uh, item where we are, I would say, focusing on both sides and connecting to with a European uh, Union-based uh, association. So, uh, started in 2019, at the moment we are having 600 plus institutional members. So from smaller companies up to Ubisoft or Flixbus, you may have heard of, which are the large scale game and mobility providers in Europe. And also I think a large number of uh, academic uh, partners plus also 18 national libraries and uh, 12, uh, uh, 18 national archives, 12 national libraries. And one thing we are maintaining here in Jena specifically has been once uh, an item, a structure which the European Commission mandated to us last uh, this year. Uh, and that is about uh, developing that field on interregional level. So it's very much, of course, that we are having different issues and topics to be dealt with uh, on different regions. So, for instance, we are working closely with Amsterdam and Santiago de Compostela. What you need to know is that both are cities which are overcrowded by tourists. So their main challenge is how they are getting a bit rid of tourists or better streaming these tourists in the city to not getting completely overcrowded. While we have other regions, as for instance, Thuringia, where we are based in, where it's completely the opposite. So we would like to have more tourists. So the question is how to deal with these both issues with uh, similar or maybe corresponding digital means. So that is something we have chance to working in here. And finally, it's about also developing these kinds on a support level. So the idea is also to developing these kind of research infrastructure and research agenda on a larger scale. So let me fin finalize with that nice uh, example from our colleagues in Paris from Ubisoft. And during pandemic times, they did a nice endeavor together with the Musée des Invalides uh, which meant that they transferred the uh, Assassin's Creed uh, grant to uh, the museum location, and you could buy a digitally enriched museum tour there with uh, several 10,000 visitors, even during the pandemic time. And from my perspective, a really nice example how to combine these four points. So that's maybe with my input session. And now I'm looking forward. I'm happy to getting into a discussion with you. Thanks for your attention so far. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. I think it was uh, excellent, uh, you know, uh, an enlightening about uh, digital cultural heritage. I think it's very important. and. Uh, and uh, really, it's enlightening how digitalization world has impact uh, humanities, where it is really also in the culture, you know, heritage aspect. It was very interesting, uh, actually. I wanted to ask a question as a start uh, that really put into my head, actually, about hermeneutics. 
3D hermeneutics, have you encountered that kind of studies into, into your studies of digital heritage? Uh, this is one of my questions. Maybe you can uh, give us some input. Yeah, many thanks for the question. And I'm happy about that. <laughs> so one thing about hermeneutics, also about these, I would say, circular processes of insights. Uh, the one object we are studying this is also with regards to, I would say, work processes. And one challenge related to that is, of course, that hermeneutics is one of the major ways for getting insights for epistemics, for, uh, I would say, in humanities, but also in the social sciences. The important point is that it is completely... Um, or that it is colliding in case of the 3D modeling processes very much with processes from other domains. And one of the challenges we have uh, investigated with regards to interdisciplinary production of these kind of uh, research products has been that there is, a, uh, I would say, a clashing of cultures with regards to that uh, hermeneutics enables us to getting new insights, also uh, changing insights into the process even at a late stage. While an engineering process, and in that case also a modeling process as an engineer-based process, are um, uh, reducing the flexibility to incorporate this kind of changes and insights. And we have seen in these projects we are analyzing in that case, as all the research workflows, that there is this clash of uh, modes of investigation where, of course, humanity's late stage changes of a full thinking model would clash with the necessity to narrow, to boil down, to problematize um, this process in the engineering world. So maybe that's one facet of uh, hermeneutics. Thank you for the for the question. Yeah, I have another one, but maybe I can give uh, a person uh, RT. You can speak, but please change your name because they use uh, Rowan's uh, uh, username and password to enter. Yeah, you can you can uh, you can you can ask a question, but tell your name first. Oh, the guy who raised his hand because you have a wrong name, so you can fix your name first, and then we can back. Uh, you can ask a question. Oh, Lawal. Ah, it's Lawal. Okay, Lawal. Go ahead. You're using two accounts. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, so uh, I would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, the professor for the presentation first. Um, professor, please, I want to know if there was any instance that errors occurred during 3D modeling and what was the outcome? Thank you for the question. May I kindly ask you for repeating the question? Uh, I said, I want to know if there was any instance that errors occurred during the 3D modeling and what was the outcome of the errors? If... Mm. That's your point. So, of course, there are various sources of error during a 3D modeling process and uh, specifically in that field of uh, dealing with historical sources. Uh, there are, I would say, different types of errors in that. So at the one hand, it's about missing information. So if you have a historic building only described in text, it's usually not saying anything about exact measurements, etc. So that is something where there is at least this point of uncertainty. Uh, of course, there are multiple other errors which could occur in that case. So up to this point of, I would say, technical errors. So in our case, we are dealing very much with image recognition on these fronts. So trying to get a 3D form out of uh, different images uh, via, I would say, uh, AI slash calculation. And of course, uh, there are lots of errors also in these uh, final calculations. 
the challenge is always, uh, I would say, on a practical base to uh, mm. determine, to identify these uh, errors and trying to mitigate, trying to fix it, mm. but also on a conceptual point mm. of view, because as also in other um, domains, mm. disciplines dealing with historical sources at least, there is a high chance that uh, also, I would say, knowledge is getting obsolete, is getting modified also after a certain period or maybe immediately or whatever. And so the still open challenge is how to making these kinds of uh, reconstructions in a way and criticize able that others could modify it later inside, including new insights or criticizing it without needing to neglect i would say a full result a full uh yeah uh, a full model in that case hope that answers your question or gives at least a bit an idea not answering it of course because that's an important question you raised and of course a very large one many thanks for that thank, thank you for your question uh, uh, i would maybe give uh, kim you can ask your question Sure, so it's it's kind of related. I'll thank you for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask because I've seen um, recently a lot of different 3D modeling that involves survivor testimony and artificial intelligence as kind of a new trend, certainly in education. Um, <clears throat> and often, so when there are, I wanted to, I, mean, I guess it's not even quite a question, but have you been studying the how that's working when it's actually, like an actual person who has lived through a historical event, recounting that event or collection of those, do you see AI's place in helping um, kind of fix those inaccuracies or present fuller pictures or is it dangerous that way? I'm just curious about the narrative, I guess, part of all of these reconstructions um, and what you've seen successful or interesting. Sorry, that was poorly framed. I hope you understood it. <laughs> Maybe, let's give it a try and many thanks also for that question. And I have to confess, I was just roughing from another uh, session where it is specifically about the use of AI technologies in the field. And uh, maybe to grasp this point, what does it mean with regards having these kind of uh, 3D representations, particularly um, created via AI. So at the one hand, of course, it's a technical strand. Of course, in that 3D field, we are getting better with the help of AI and there are lots of technologies uh, trying to overcome the current issue for having, uh, for needing a large amount of data for having, I would say, um, meaningful 3D reconstructions. Nevertheless, I think in the field of objects, 3D processing, we are still uh, a bit more away from uh, generating them automatically than it is, for instance, for LLMs, transformer-based technologies in the textual and image-based field, that case. So that's maybe specifically on 3D. The other point you mentioned here is uh, indeed the question of uh, how um, how ethical is it to deal with these points? And what does it mean with regards to creating these kind of 3D representations and keeping on the other hand the point that it is still a hypothesis generated by AI or by humans or whatever. And uh, one important challenge related to that is of course the point that we have the so-called nomothetic uh, uh, um, point of view on things, which means that uh, images are per se very much convincing and having high chance to uh, proposing at least a an idea about a, a reality which was not there. We humans, from my understanding, okay. are very bad in distinguishing between uh, or to, 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 to recognizing that something which is even generated by a LLM and a image generator is still hypothetical and not uh, reality. And the same as with 3D visualizations, whatever source it is, to keeping clearly in mind that it is hypothetical, so that is something which is still challenging. 
And of course, there is much research also about these topics, the naturalness of visualization versus the abstractness of our visualizations, etc. But it is a open issue. Thank you, Professor. I grasped the question correctly. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Kimberly. And uh, we have now Professor Martin Leiner, who was RT. I refuse them to speak because I need people to change their names and students to really appear with the right names. But Professor La Martin Leiner, it's good to have you. We know you are sick, but I don't know you are raising your hands. So we'll give you the question if you want to ask your question, Professor. I don't know if he is online or he's a little bit sick, so I don't know if he's going to ask. Okay. Hello, Professor, are you with us? We can't, you are unmuted. So now can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And sorry for this technical problem. Yeah, I was the whole time miss you and I am very excited about the things you are doing. I think they are really beautiful and um, giving a lot of new opportunities and uh, uh, thought provoking as well what you are researching. So I'm very happy about this presentation. And I would like also to ask a question as we are working on peace and reconciliation, um, what could be the direct uh, possibilities to connect your work with a work uh, in favor of peace and reconciliation? For example, what comes to my mind is to conserve um, cultural heritage or to restore cultural heritage digitally, uh, which has been destroyed by wars but there might be also other things like uh, like showing for example how people work live together which are now in wars with each other and how they interacted or to show uh, also the destruction of a war and uh, what uh, it made um, so but you have certainly uh, better ideas because you are in the, the topic and I would like to ask you on this point. Thank you very much. And thanks for this question. And I have to confess also not to having, I would say, a fully fleshed out answer on that, but at least maybe some ideas in which direction it could go. One idea is, of course, uh, this point of cultural heritage, and of course there is uh, much discussion about up to which extent heritage, also cultural identity, also maybe symbols of cultural identity could support this point of at least forming an identity and also maybe supporting, that is something you know better than me of course, but maybe supporting also this point of uniting or having at least something like a joined a common history together on these things. So that is one thing, of course, in many cases, uh, use supported with regards to, uh, in our case in the European Union, to have something like a joint European idea or identity also with regards to a specific, I would say, uh, buildings, also to specific monuments, etc. At the moment, there's a large European Commission induced uh, movement for collecting some, uh, I would say, national monuments from all over Europe in order to coming to something which would be, I would say, a um, distillation of uh, European identity, building identity in that case. That's one thing. The second point is, of course, to uh, analyzing how places transformed over time and, of course, to making accessible, visible, but also analyzable how, for instance, different cultural streams went into, I would say, one single place and how these places also became a melting pot at a certain point. So we uh, are working with uh, colleagues in in Jerusalem, uh, uh, who are, I would say, trying to model and to recreate how the city of Jerusalem transferred and transformed over time. Of course, very much with regards to building uh, history, but also it's a question of how cultural identities there formed, transferred over time. And finally, as you mentioned, this point of 
also heritage in risk and also the heritage which is connected to uh, um, uh, reconciliation and also peace building. So one example, a colleague of mine is uh, working on for, uh, for uh, the Near East is, uh, for instance, for digitizing, for at least documenting also historic refugee camps and at therefore also documenting and uh, archiving how these kind of relics of uh, war times in that case uh, extend, uh, uh, were extend or changed over time. Just some ideas to share with you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. I think uh, Great. that's Thank uh, you. The FIAG project with this uh, yeah, person, I remember. I, I also, I will I will give uh, Roger to ask questions and then I will ask questions before uh, the ending. I think that's uh, would keep it. I think also we have some comments from Kimberly as well. Uh, she's saying, if there's time, I'm also curious about the trend of combining interactive eyewitness narrative based on testimony from survivors of political violence. For example, as helpful to problematic for reconciliation and how to how that is being addressed through trained or studied in, in recent examples. So first we go to Roger. Roger, are you? Yes, you thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, sir, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, please, I didn't quite get how you treat the digital realization of cultural heritage from historic sources that seem incomplete or questionable. Hmm. Um, you mean specifically what, uh, how to deal with the with these kinds of historical objects which are in conflict yeah. or in conflict at this point? Indeed, that's a challenge, as also with other items, where I would say it's about reflecting in any kind of media how uh, how to include different opinions, how to include also different views on objects. Of course, with regards to uh, buildings, uh, it's something where we have at least maybe a bit more easier dealing with that, at least since it is most cases for having, I would say, reconstructed, restated a specific uh, state at a specific time. But at least at this moment where it is about which time has been chosen or something like this, then it is a potential uh, conflict which could be behind that. So from my view, there is still no clear answer on these things. I have to confess that also with these uh, approaches, we are dealing with that. It's the idea to getting a bit independent from that, but it's not fully uh, possible in any way, uh, of course, to, uh, um, to, uh, to, to dealing with this topic. So no clear solution, but the uh, problem you're fully right that is an important one. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I have one uh, question that I would like to, I wanted to ask at the beginning, but still I have it still in my mind. You wrote about digital transformation in digital culture. So have you interacted with digital transformation in, uh, in behavioral uh, ethnography? This is what I was, because you, you said how I, I liked how you said digital transformation is being applied. And this is what we call ethnography, but did you apply, did you have like upgrade to uh, digital transformation and human behaviors on social sciences? Digital human behavior on social sciences. I see your point. Uh, in that case, definitely not in that depth as you are doing it. Uh, so uh, most uh, very appreciated uh, what you are doing, uh, but um, at least a bit. So in our case, it's very much also how uh, I would say a human behavior of doing photographs, of drawing uh, plans, also of creating, rebuilding parts of a city, etc. That is something which becomes, of course, obvious and uh, visible also by reconstructing these kinds of cities. And in that case, it brings also some, I would say, nice insights. For instance, how I would say also something like an ideal of aesthetics is changing over time. So what are people seeing as pretty versus 
maybe not as pretty, but are the, I would say, most photographed views with, of course, some, I would say, not very surprising insights that, of course, a photographic behavior uh, is very much similar at a certain point and specific views of uh, buildings or something like uh, are also very much changing over time, but being similar within a specific time frame. So the so people are copying, copy pasting also an aesthetic ideal by others. Of course, always the question who was first there, who was the trendsetter, et cetera. So that's maybe one thing we are having more as a kind of uh, connected uh, outcome result on that. Although, of course, we are not focusing too much on ethnographics and also the analysis uh, of how uh, uh, social sciences behavior and social sciences are changing over time. Thank you, Professor. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Um, also, you can ask, uh, we'll take Kimberly's question one last time. And I know um, that, uh, if yeah. you wouldn't <laughs> mind, I have to confess that I now have to switch to my next appointment. I'm very okay. sorry for that. Uh, then it was but, great to have you, uh, Professor. I wanted to thank you very much. So also for this really lively, interesting discussion and the action. So all the best for you. And thank you, um, and thank you so much for this inspiring discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one, Professor. And we thank you by in the name of Armina. Thank you for having you in our, in our session. And we would like to have you again. With pleasure. Many okay. thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 So this uh, we are. Uh, bye. Bye.